All right. I believe we're live. Yep. Okay. Welcome to the Sunday Lovecraft Easy Show, everyone who's watching. Uh, today is October the 19th, 2014. And we're going to talk about two things today. Um, we're going to talk about the new uh, movie. Well, it's been out about a year or so, I believe, but it's it's coming out on the DVD soon, and it's already out on Amazon Video on Demand. Uh, the Thing on the Doorstep, which is a very, very good adaptation. So we're going to talk to the creators of that film. They're here. And then when we're done talking to them about that, we're going to talk about the recent permuted press drama and author contracts and all that kind of stuff. So uh, you guys are more than welcome to stick around for that, or you can leave at that point, or whatever you want to do. It's totally fine. We're, we love having you here. So um, you guys want to... Introduce yourself. Will, you want to start? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm Will Severn. I was the producer and the com uh, composer for the film. Uh, and with me is uh, Mary Jane Hansen. Uh, she was the screenwriter. She did the adaptation and uh, played the role of uh, Azimuth Waite in the film. I was and, you look familiar. <laughs> <laughs> and Tom's joining us. Uh, Tom? Hi, I'm Tom Glisterman, and I was the director of the film. Well, thanks yeah. for being here, guys. Um, thanks for having us, Mike. Yeah. Now, the first question I have, you know, I think this is unfortunate that some people think this way, but some people do think that, you know, it, the story is set back, what, in the 1920s, and some people, you know, any time you adapt a story that's a period story, uh, it wasn't a period story at the time, of course, but I guess it is now, uh, and you adapt it to a modern setting, some people don't like it, but I have to say that I it was extremely well done. And, uh, you know, it brings Lovecraft, makes it more real when it's set in the modern world, in my opinion. So uh, my first question is, what what influenced your decision? What made you guys decide to, to set it in the here and now? Well, I'll go first. Mike, you said something that was... Uh that I think was one of the things that influenced our decision is that we wanted to make it more accessible and at the same time you know, so to bring people into this world but use a lot of Lovecraft language that still felt alien, that still you know, felt like someplace else and um, so uh, by combining the two we can have the best of both worlds. Yeah, yeah. We, also, we also didn't want to tackle a, a period piece per se um, we did want to modernize it. We did want it to be in the sort of here and now, but we wanted it to harken back. And I think that, that was sort of the another way, another thing that we took into the production. Um, and then probably, you know, as as a put another producer hat, <laughs> it's certainly it's much less expensive to do something that's today and now than it would be to do something that was set in the twenties. So you know that was obviously a, something we thought about as well. Yeah, um, you're a small film company or a small press like me, or you have to do what you can to put out a quality product at, uh, as cheaply as you can. Exactly. Um, uh, I should remind everybody watching, should have said this at the beginning, but Will's got some DVDs uh, of the film already, and we're going to give away three DVDs to some random viewers, so keep watching, and you could. Let me put you on the screen there. Go ahead and hold that up. There you go. Can uh, I ask, uh, for the rest of us, will we be able to order this from somewhere? Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's going to be available. Uh, it is available at, for pre-order on Amazon.com now. Uh, is it's that also your preferred venue? What's that? Is that your preferred venue, or is there a place where you make a little bit more money, like you have your own website? Um, no, it's, it's not, there's not really a preferred venue at this point. Um, that's probably the easiest place to pre-order it. Uh, the, there'll be other retail outlets that'll be available at as well. Um, and if you're doing the video on demand thing, Amazon right now is probably the easiest one before it goes to other platforms. Yeah, for everybody watching, if you want to watch it tonight, when, you know, if you're done watching this show, because it sounds so good, and it is a, it is a great film, I gotta say. Uh, if you go to the Lovecraft Easing website, uh, I've got a, it's on the left side banner. Just click on the the thing on the uh, doorstep poster, and it'll take you right to the Amazon Video on Demand. Um, I don't there, have. A there, there's yet. our preferred site. I'm sorry. <laughs> I said there's our preferred site. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. I, I don't have a link to the DVD yet because it's not not available yet. 
Yeah, that's, yeah, I think, what is it, November 18th? The video, yeah, the DVD is officially released uh, November 18th. Now, is there any reason, uh, these days I, I prefer owning my movies digitally, uh, yeah. but none of the ones that way. Is there a reason, is there an extra incentive, do you have any extras on the DVD at all? Um, yeah. No, we didn't do commentaries or anything like that this time out. Um, but I think that, you know, I mean, there are a lot of folks that still want physical product. It's like books. I mean, you could do the yeah. digital downloads of books, but some people just want that tactile thing to, to hold and to, to have, you know, so. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. We were, actually, one of we were actually pretty surprised when the distributor said that they wanted to release DVDs. We were like, really? Yeah, but, you know. <laughs> apparently, okay. apparently somebody can make money doing that. So. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, there, and there are a couple of. Well, still, there's some uh, chains, some um, home movie stores that you can go to. Yeah, there are get, still video get stores. Get a hard copy and rent. I mean, it's out Believe there. it or not, it's true. I've heard of that. <laughs> I know, right? it seems so alien now. It's so old school. <laughs> yeah, in fact. Yeah, when you're, yeah, but, you know, there's a lot of us old guys. And <laughs> as well, when your internet goes out, I can still go play a DVD. And true. when I want to go over to John's on movie night and want to stop and pick up a couple of things to eat and um, I can carry my DVD over to his house and we can put it in his player and we can watch the movie and have a great time. It, it does really simplify things. It does. And, and the other thing too is I, I can't help it. Now, well, first off is, you got to remember, like is in Japan, CDs still vastly outsell digital formats. People want physical product. They yeah. are afraid something could happen and their digital product disappears. Mm -hmm. Your yeah, physical you know product is right in your bookshelf. You know, I just had an issue where my computer, the, the, the <laughs> operating system faulted and I had to get it wiped. And uh, I didn't have backup on like about three months of photographs and a couple digital downloads. They're just gone. Can't be recovered. Yeah. So what Joe says ring resonates pretty hard. You know, yeah, um, you know the, the, the debate, uh, like Kindle versus print books, you know, you have people on one side, people on the other side. I, I feel like much the same way that I feel like about this, DVDs versus um, digital, is that they both, each has, has, has their strengths and each has their weaknesses. Oh, absolutely. I wasn't, I wasn't dismissing... Oh, no, you, di you are. Just, I would, I would, you're dismissing me. That's yeah. There you are. <laughs> well, you're you're just a whippersnapper. You don't know anything. <laughs> Shut up and let the people know about making movies. All right, so I have my next novel now. You old people with your DVDs and your <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, oh my god. <laughs> if you're my old, old is actually... like me, you wouldn't be around. Yeah. Listening to <laughs> FM radio. Three, <laughs> four FM. Uh, a cassette <laughs> tape, and I figure that that's like a security device because if I lay it down, no one's ever going to try and steal it. <laughs> um, well, getting back to the movie as opposed to the medium, um, get, without giving away it too much of how you executed the plot, I mean, I think we all know the plot. Can you talk a little bit about the movie um, and the characters, um, you guys? Um. Um, well, we were doing an interview the other day, and uh, somebody brought up uh, how did you approach the character, and it's a you know as an if is a it, it's an interesting character because it's not it can't be just approached from one side. I mean, she has like her main objective is always to. Uh, convince the person that she's talking to that she is who she says she is, uh, and yeah. so that's. I think yeah, that's I the think defining feature of that character is that she's not just one person, you know. Yeah, certainly a vessel for all, all sorts of characters. My, yeah. my, I think one of the things I find so fascinating about the story is that she's really like Ephraim Waite, yeah. possessing yeah. the body of his daughter. Right. So what did you do to get yourself in character for that? that yeah, this I was, was going to say, how many hours of makeup did you have to go through? <laughs> <laughs> to become an old man? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we just hired somebody else for that part. <laughs> it was easier. 
Well, well, Pete, you have something to say about this character, don't you? That you typically. Well, there, I have a, a a small take on on the character because he he is set, uh, uh, central to my latest novel, um, the Weird Company, and there there's a little bit of of lore that in writing that everyone seems to forget. Mm. In fact, they forget her mother completely. Yeah. Yeah. And her mother was actually, after she was born, locked up in the attic. Yep. Oh. In, oh, yeah. In, so. And then confined to a mental institution where she died. Yeah. Mm. Actually, not not in in the original novel, but yeah, other people have. Are, are, yeah, I've I've read it sincerely. They just locked her up, and she eventually dies. Um, but you got to imagine what could possibly be so horrific that you would lock the, your wife up in the attic when you're living in Innsmouth. <laughs> well, what? It doesn't have to be horrific at all. He's just a despicable person in this original yeah. story. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. He, he is a sort of a in history. Joe Pulver and Matt Carpenter agree. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't buy that, Joe. And she and she she is a half breed, so she there yeah. there is something of her that came from someplace yeah. else, like the sea. So, um, yeah. there's yeah, so I, I play. She never spoke English. She she always spoke some sort of other language. So so I play with the origin of of, of her mother and why she was locked away in, in in the novel, and also some of um and how that feeds into Ephraim Ephraim's uh, motivations. So when you say the novel, you're talking about your book? My book. Oh, yeah. okay, I'm sorry. sorry. Uh, yeah. Are you a writer? No, you, you know, I am <laughs> I, you know, I sit in front of the, the, key, the keyboard and pound my head, and occasionally words come out. Yeah, that's, that's basically it. That's every writer ever. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of that, I have a question from the audience. Uh, uh, James says, question for Ms. Hansen, what was the biggest challenge in writing the adaptation? Um, well, I mean, when you're working with a group, when you're collaborating, uh, that's always a challenge. So, um, you know, you let people read it, you, you want input, and then it ends up being something that it didn't start out being, and then through the process of collaborating with people that you really trust, um, Tom and Will, uh, it, it becomes what it needs to be. And so, you know, the biggest challenge is not just trying to do what you, your initial instinct, you know, and, and having that be the only way, you know, opening yourself up to um, to a true art form, which is always collaboration. Yeah, I think that, you know, adaptation-wise, we, we honestly approached it from a very, you know, faithful adaptation is what we were looking to do. Um, yeah, I suppose that was also the other challenge is uh, yeah. we wanted to be really faithful. Uh, to to the words and not try and make it something that you know that it wasn't because it wasn't enough and well, I think yeah and there was there was also the fact that we we, we made a, fe a feature film from a short story so there was all a lot of stuff that was added in yeah you know, that, was, that you I, when when adding it in you try to remain faithful as well but right. you know you, you do blow it up you know we blew it up and then we reined it all back in again. You know, I think we probably cut out 20 minutes to get to the length that we ended up. Yeah. yeah. So there's a director's cut. Uh, no, 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 I think the, I think the final cut's the director's cut. I, I, yeah. I, I, I think the final I like, like the final the cut. Nova, you know, and then, like, yeah. right back to where it, it should be. And it's also, you know, new characters are introduced, relationships developed, all those things to, to flesh it out, to kind of bring it into more of a feature length as opposed to, you know, the, the original short story. Characters were, were added and then they were cut. Yep, that happened too. You know? so, now, this is a pie-in-the-sky thing, but I always wish they would do this with the uh, H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society pictures. Is there any way you could, like, send a copy to, like, Sci-Fi or something? Maybe they could do a late-night showing. It just... Mm -hmm. It's so frustrating that these really great movies are made and they just don't get any kind of uh, um, screen time generally, you know? Yeah. That, like, this has got to be a better movie than, than a lot of the, like, for example, the original Dunwich Horror. It's a horrible film. 
and all the it look, it's much better than a lot of the crap they played on sci-fi. <laughs> yeah, yeah, did you see any contacts? You know, spending the last year and a half uh, playing with playing with or discussing things with distributors, it, it, it's it's a whole animal unto itself. Where there's people who have, you know, relationships with people and they're doing favors. It's just all you know. There is that game that has to be played, and is just the way it is. And you do the best you can. Yeah. So, so Matt, just just to to put things in perspective, next weekend. I'm on a on a panel with Tara Reed talking about Sharknado. Yeah. <laughs> but that's one of the classics. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Isn't there isn't Sharknado still out now? Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's bigger. Wow. Yeah. The, I, the, the word is the, you you don't want to star in those movies. You just want the guest slot. <laughs> exactly. Stars are always forgotten, but yeah, you want that guest slot. Yeah. You know, um, I want to say to everybody watching that I wouldn't have these guys on the show if I didn't think this was a, a really great movie. It really was, and one of the reasons why it was was uh, I'm, for more than one reason. I mean, you wrote the adaptation, Mary, but your performance was just spectacular. Um, <sighs> So, really yeah, I, yeah. Mary, Mary was great, and and, and I, I, there were a whole bunch of solid people in the movie, and and you know it was something that we spent a lot of time with trying to make that happen. And uh, yeah, no, it, it was it was a lot of fun to watch, and uh, you know all throughout the process, it was a really pro prolonged process. We ended up shooting this over I don't know five years or so, and. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was uh, it was fun to always come back to every uh, once a month for five years. Well, yeah. I didn't realize you did, you did it for that long. Oh yeah, yeah it took a long time. Continuity was a huge challenge. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, um, now you guys won an award at the HP Lovecraft Film Festival, didn't you? You want to talk about that? Yeah, we, we won the uh, you know we initially premiered the film. Actually, our first festival appearance was at the HP Lovecraft Film Festival in California. Uh, the one that uh, the Aaron puts on, mm -hmm. and uh, subsequently we ended up playing later in Portland. Uh, you know, with Brian and Gwen over at the mm -hmm. uh, the HP Lovecraft Film Festival, and uh, we won the uh, best feature uh, that year, which was you know, which was great. You know, yeah, um, I remember you coming out there and telling me you were you were pumped. But yeah, well, well deserved. So. Yeah, it was fun. We also won the HP uh, Lovecraft Award at the uh, at the Flickers Film Festival, which is in Rhode Island. Oh in yeah. Providence, yeah. No less, um, which was uh, was the summer before that, which was a uh, which which was really fun as well. He got there. I really like in the uh, trailer. Uh, you, you, people love that opening line. It's one of the favorite opening lines to an HP Lovecraft story. It's you great. Know, that I have sent six bullets through the head of my best friend. It's right. a great line. <laughs> yeah, but you know, you guys use that in the trailer, which I think was really smart and awesome. Is there a better way to start that movie? I don't yeah, think so. I don't think so either. <laughs> yeah. Which is funny because Lovecraft uses it twice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he's he, at the end. Does he, he steals or, from himself from Reanimator? Oh, oh yeah. six shots after midnight. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Well, I I really don't well, think it works. works. <laughs> Uh, don't let me hog the question, guys. If anybody else has questions for these guys, please shout out. Um, uh, I have a question. Uh, yeah. I noticed that uh, Mrs. Upton was one of the characters you added. Uh, yeah. Yep. Because she's she's referred to, but she's never referred to by name, or she's not an important character. But you know, if if you're married, you know how how much influence uh, <laughs> your spouse can have on your life and your and the decisions you make. And so it would be impossible to um, imagine. This man having this kind of crisis and making these decisions, especially, you know, set in this time period, without yeah. really involving that other person in his life. Yeah, yeah and she she was really a, it ended up being sort of this voice of reason. Mm -hmm. Sort of, she was she was almost that modern day uh, that modern day balance that would keep like peeking in on this story and going, what? What? Why would you do that? <laughs> You know, and basically, uh, you know, uh, the transition she makes throughout the story is, is is the realization that, oh, my gosh, 
Some things yeah. are not so real. Yeah, it's that whole skeptic uh, voice of reason to believer at the end, you know what I mean? So, right, right. Like, I cannot deny what is going on anymore. And that's that's classic Lovecraft, I think. When, right. you know, you, you know you're, you're strung along, you're strung along, maybe, 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 and then, bam, the reality of it is so much worse. Like my third you. marriage. <laughs> I'll take your word for it, man. Again, <laughs> uh, everybody, for... Everybody watching, we're gonna give away uh, three copies of the of the DVD to uh, some random live viewers. If you're watching this later, recorded, thanks for watching, but we've already given them away. So, um, but uh, let's see here. What was I gonna ask you guys? Uh, oh, what made you guys decide this particular story uh, way back at the beginning? Um, you know, we, look, we looked at some different stories. We looked at Pickman's model. I know there had been a few adaptations done of that. Um, but this one just hit us because of the fact that it's it really does have that three-act traditional you know thing that would really lend itself to a film. Um, and the female character. <sighs> yeah, that's true. Uh, and also, and also a great opening line. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It does. It just grabs you. It's like, you know, it starts off with a bang and, okay, you're along for the ride. Um, but, but there, there is that traditional story arc, mm -hmm. um, that, and it lends itself to a film adaptation where a lot of his other work would, you know, be much tougher to kind of put in that format, you know? So to, to us, it was more, this works. And of course the female character. Yeah. Although I gotta say, if you want to do say another movie, um, uh, Mm. I just saw a play, an adaptation of The Shadow over Innsmouth, where they made the protagonist a woman. You oh, pick up an idea, you could do the, wow, cool. You could do The Call of Cthulhu <laughs> and make the protagonist a woman. You don't lose anything right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. the story because Lovecraft's characters were mostly sexually neutral. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah, yeah. And Ken Light always says the thing, the most manly thing that uh, Olmstead does in The Shadow Over Innsmouth is he screams and faints by a train track. Not to tell tales out of school, but we're, we're actually working on a, a short piece right now that is pretty Lovecraft-based, mm -hmm. and that, it, that we did do, uh, we did switch around uh, some characters. Uh, Genders. Not based on the story, but it's Lovecraftian-themed, you mean? No, it's actually, well, it's very loosely based on a story, but it's one of those things, as you watch it, you probably discover that. So you know, it's, sure in the house? Is well, that too much? Might be. Yeah. Okay. Right. Never mind. <laughs> too late. <laughs> we should discuss these things before we go online. <laughs> well, let me, you know, speaking of that, though, let me ask you a question. Um, I posted about this about a year ago, because everyone, Lovecraft fans are always screaming for Del Toro to do uh, at the Mountain of Madness. Now, I yeah, he's a good filmmaker. I don't know why he's the only one who can do Mountains of Madness. But my question on that is, is you, uh, this is a perfect example because you guys did such an excellent job with the thing on the doorstep. Uh, now, obviously, something like at the Mountains of Madness would be more expensive to do. You probably have to do a Kickstarter or something, but. I, I don't think it would, I mean, how insane would it be? I mean, you'd have to find some, a snowy area and so forth, but is that out of the question? Not you guys personally, but what do you we think about it? We live in a snowy area, so... <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, it's not like we all live in Florida or Texas. Right. I, I think anybody approaching a film, you know, has to obviously make do with what they have, and nothing, you know, can't be tackled with a, without with a, with a great idea. You can get done what you need to get done, mm -hmm. and it's really just getting the people vested emotionally and financially, uh, but even more emotionally, I think, it, you know, yeah. it is is the key to getting these things done. Uh, you know, when we started making uh, Doorstep, it was uh, we started it almost as a you know as a, a fun thing to do. And we all said, you know, let's keep working at this as long as it's still fun. Because we've heard so many, you know, we're, we're all filmmakers. We've been doing this for a long time. Uh, this is our first feature. We've just been, you know, we're commercial filmmakers. And 
uh, we just said, let's, you know, I, I don't want us, this to ruin our relationship. Let's see what happens. And we did. We got, we got through it. And, uh, you know, we're, we're all, hey, we're still talking. Well, speaking of that, how difficult was it working with Will? <laughs> I've been, I have been working with Will for so long, I, you know, it, I can't tell you. My, the line is, I started working with Will when he was 12. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. pretty close to that, actually. Uh, that was probably my first professional scoring gig. Uh, I did a main title theme and end title, I think, for a for a piece Tom had actually worked on. So that was that was probably my first professional job as a you know twelve year old. Yeah. Yes. Well, speaking of that, you want to talk about scoring this, Will? What was, sure. your, what was your approach? Yeah. Um. What did you want to accomplish? What kind of you know, just whatever you want to say about it, I guess. Sure. Sure. Uh. Well, I mean, you know. I wanted to approach it as musically speaking, and Tom and I and Mary had talked about this. I mean, even though we had set it in present day, we wanted to do something that kind of was more about the atmosphere, that wasn't about the cheap jump scares, that, you know, was more about, in some ways, very traditional and classic. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I approached the score kind of from the same angle, uh, being that I, I knew I wanted to do something that was or orchestral in nature. Um, I wanted to do something that was more traditional that way. I wanted to do, uh, you know, the, the mood. You know, I think about, like, those old Hammer movies. Um, things like that where, you know, I, I suppose I maybe pulled some inspiration from there, the, that that osmosis. But, mm -hmm. you know, doing something that I wanted to have a theme, a few themes where it was like, oh, there's something you could hang on to there. Um, as a composer, it's like I feel like a lot of modern film music, while... There's a lot of great stuff out there. I think a lot of composers' hands are tied, where the music is literally, oh, we'll create a mood, but there's not memorable melodies like you used to have. They're far and few between nowadays. It's not because they're not, they can't be written. It's just the issue that people tend to, what do you want to say, it just becomes more mood music these days as opposed to having a character of its own. Because, I mean, that musically speaking, I felt like I wanted to support the characters and you know, get a little bit of that light motif thing going on that you used to have, yeah. um, and then you know, surprises in the music here and there. You know, so some, some like even the main title. I wanted something that was like a little bit of a journey. It keeps switching up on you. You know, that sort of thing. Um, the first movie I watched, I, I was uh, seventeen at the time. That really, it, where it really hit me that uh, what you just said about the mu the music almost being a character of its own was. Uh, the Michael Keaton Batman movie, you know. Oh, totally, totally. You know? And Warner Brothers tried so desperately to make it all about Prince's album and Prince's music, you know. And But everyone loved Danny Elfman's score so much, you know. Yeah, I've always been a huge fan. I mean, that and then, you know, obviously, like, I first time I'd heard him was Pee Wee's Big Adventure, which I still think is an awesome score. It's a lot of fun. Right. You know? Oh, it is great. No, I think it's it's so funny. We were talking about the period piece nature of it. It's almost like you know the the locations in large part were very period. The music had that sort of certainly nod to the period aspect of it. You know, the the things that weren't period were the home that uh, Daniel and Marion lived in and uh, and their clothes. You know, there there's so so much of this piece. It, there was that you know, and it was intentional. We wanted to do that nod. Of trying to sort of walk this balance between the two eras. Uh, speaking of that, what about the sets and where you filmed and everything? What was that your house? It, did I understand what you what you said? Correctly? There's, so, there's there was, well, we, we we shot. Oh, well, we're all from upstate New York, and, and we all sh and we shot most of the film in this area. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, we went to Cape Cod to shoot beach. Uh, water stuff, but um, we live we we, ha we live in a place that has a lot of historic houses, and uh, and we leaned on that. Uh, the the main old house that you see in the the film, you know, there there's the inside and the outside are probably five different houses. Yeah. So it was, it was all mixed up in that respect. Um, but uh, yeah, the Will's family uh, lives in or parents certainly live in a, a big old house that that uh, that a lot of the movie ended up taking place in. So. And some of it actually, uh, well, a little bit of it was shot in your dining room, Tom. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I've seen it in my dining room. 
-hmm. Yeah, there, it, we uh, we uh, it, it it was a lot of a lot of double duty in a lot of different locations. Yeah, was, uh, was, we we certainly didn't shoot anything in a studio, so everything was all location level. Was that I was just saying, was that Upton's dining room that was you, was just your dining room? No, that was the Derby dining room actually. Yeah, the Derby dining room. Yeah. 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 Um, we scout sure. locations as well, like uh, some of the exteriors. You know that that we 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 we're lucky enough to live in an area where there's some really cool architecture. Um, so some of the exteriors that we found, it's kind of like as you're going through the scripts, like that place would be perfect. You know, so some yeah. places you knew, and other places you had to search for. But yeah, yeah. When when Will found Crown and Shield, we were like, oh my gosh, that is amazing. Yeah. It was this, it's so this, bizarre. A crazy old house, and and we we had to shoot it so that uh, we had to shoot it was way out in the country, and we had to. There's this one scene uh, uh, between Gilman and uh, Daniel at Upton where they're talking, and and uh, they're both in, actually when we're shooting the reverses of each other, we're one's in Saratoga, the other one's in Schuylerville, which is like 20 miles away, because we had to make it look like the house was really across the street from 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 each other. So it was. Uh, you know, a lot of blocking and and uh, continuity issues going on. But yeah, we found a lot of inter really interesting places. I'm trying to. It's been a little while since I've seen it. I need to rewatch it. It's been about a year because you had sent me a digital copy. Okay. Uh, well. But um, how many actors did you have? Probably 40. 40 by the time we were done. Yeah, by the time we were done. Probably, <laughs> probably main people. There was probably 20. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, maybe a dozen. Like what, what, I, what you would consider sort of uh, certainly speaking parts, you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. so did, did you pay these guys? Did they do it because they wanted to be part of this project? They had a passion we paid our it? actors, with the exception of me. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's yeah. pretty much You've never acted before? What's that? Mary, did I? Oh, did yeah, that's what I, that's what I do, and that's what oh. I've always done. I was sent. Okay, um, I was what yeah. what's the, what did the whole thing cost to produce? Um, all our wedding money. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. you know that honeymoon that they never took. Um, <laughs> yeah. Did, I think basically yeah, what it amounted to was, yeah. you know, for us, it was an issue of uh, us three getting together and deciding we wanted to do it. So, I mean, obviously. We didn't pay ourselves a donation yeah. of services on our own to kind of make it happen, and we right. all probably wore ten hats apiece. Yeah. Um, you know, we basically budgetary, budgetarily speaking, it was really more about locations, uh, actors, some set dressing, props, uh, and you know, making sure that we had the right equipment to do what needed to be done. Uh, yeah. But you know, essentially, how are you able to pay, how are you able to fund it? Um, we actually funded it ourselves. We self-funded. Uh, you know, what, what, what we'd sort of have going for us between this sort of triumvirate is when you think that between the three of us, you have a composer, you have a writer, you have a director, and you have an editor. Um, that's a lot of the main components that people spend money on when making a film. Mm -hmm. And um, hopefully we're all good enough at what we do to, to justify our, our roles. But, uh, you know, that's really a large part of what, why uh, we can uh, sort of do this kind of thing. Yeah, but by no, you know, it, this, nobody ended up, like, in big debt over this, and, uh, and it just took a lot of blood, blood, sweat, and tears, you know? It, you know, but it didn't take a lot of shekels, you know? And it's also, yeah. also, once we get into post, especially, I mean, it really is pretty much like it's just us. So it's not as if you're shelling out money for all those services and posts that you traditionally would, you know, because we're kind of self-contained that way. Um, and, you know, we try to keep things small. It's like you're going to have a few bigger shoots. You're going to have a few things where there's more people and more things to wrangle, and you kind of plan accordingly. But generally speaking, a lot of the stuff was much more intimate and, you know, more guerrilla style. You and know? so that you have those those really important core positions, but then there's also like props and catering. We did that too, you know. Yeah. So we, like there's yeah. all other little things. Like we we've uh, like Will and I work together, and we go on a commercial shoot, and we have sixty people on the crew, and then we get together and we do one of these things, 
and we go on a shoot, and we look around, and there's five of us, including the actor. You know, it's it's just you know we understand that it's a different animal, and we know both animals. And I'm not below dragging cables. I've had to do plenty of that. You know, oh, yeah. lashing. No, it's. Just, I think what we do is we, the, uh, we don't we don't kill ourselves. It's like we, we don't say, oh, we're gonna go shoot uh, you know ten pages of script today. Yeah. You know, it's like That's we a good way to burn we do want to we do want to stop and have a beer every now and then. You know. Yeah, we do that too. You guys alluded to another movie uh, film that you're working on, but are you are you, do you see in the future? Possibly another feature film, Lovecraftian feature film. Do you think you would ever tackle this again? Or? Oh yeah, we're, we're having so much fun doing the thing that we're doing. On we've been talking about whether we blow it up. Mm, okay. you, know, uh, you know who knows? Uh, but uh, it's always it's always we're always talking about it. You know so. Oh, there's no doubt that we're going to make a feature. It's really. And we did really really enjoy um, you know meeting. The Lovecraft fan base and having them be a part of this this process, uh, you know, and and like the biggest thing for me, like I don't read reviews or anything like that. I try not to anyway because as a as an artist or as a performer, you just try to do what you've been directed to do or what you set out to do, and you try not to be too much affected by the outside of of that. But you know, the be the biggest compliments come from people like you, Mike, who are the Lovecraft. Base or you know you're um, uh, sort of uh, one of the foundation the people that just hold it up you know and, and keep it going and to say that you know like that H. P. Lovecraft himself might have been proud of what we did that's the most important thing and and just you know um, so so meeting going uh, to these festivals and meeting these people was so amazing that I can't imagine that we won't do something else. Yeah, I mean it's I like. You do feel almost like it's extended family after a while. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I, I just wish you guys could make some money. You know that would uh, let you fund another project. Oh, I don't. I don't think that that's necessarily outside the realm of possibility. Yeah. You know, I, I don't think. I don't think our aim is not to make features as strictly a hobby, and you never know. It 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 certainly feels that way sometimes. Well, in a in a, in a Kickstarter world now that. It's it's a lot more doable, you might say. It's a lot less pie in the sky. Um, oh yeah, we haven't even we haven't even in investigated that aspect yeah. yet. Well, you know, the nice thing if if you ever do go the Kickstarter route, the nice thing is is you can point to this film and say, you know, look at what a great job we did with this one. Um, you know, we want to do another one. And that's our that's our goal, really. It's like you know, you you, you do something, it's a stepping stone to the next thing. Um, you know, for us still, it's a labor of love. I mean, you're telling these stories because it's something you feel you have to do and you have a passion for. Um, yeah. You know, like, I mean, we have... Yeah, I've been saying for over a year now that there's no reason... When we have such... Uh, I don't know if... The, you know, small publishing, small filmmakers, I don't know if that's the best word, but I guess that's the only word I can use. They do a better job in 90% of the... 90% of the time with Lovecraftian films than these big filmmakers. And so I don't know why we have to wait for a, a studio to do something like At the Mountains of Madness, you know? We, you know I just want to say something. You know the movie uh, Dia Farba, the color? Yeah. Brilliant yeah. adaptation of the color out of space. They made that movie on essentially a shoestring, but they took the notice that they got and parlayed it into an Indiegogo campaign to film a, uh, an original movie kind of based on Lovecraft stories called The Dreamlands. And on their Indiegogo campaign, they raised 47,000 euros. Hmm. So if you get good notice from this, you may be able to raise some funds now by parlaying off your obvious skills and success. Yeah. We could do quite a bit with 47,000 euros. <laughs> yeah, they're also even getting a little more money from the German government, but, you know, that's the German government. Yeah. You know, everyone thinks that yeah. I keep coming back to at the mountains of madness. Everyone seems to think it's so impossible. But really, when it comes down to it, the only thing stopping a small filmmaker from making at the mountains of madness is money. And if you can raise the money through Kickstarter, uh, you know, there you go. 
Hmm. But uh, I, you know, I can't think of anybody else who I, I've seen a lot of Lovecraftian films. I mean, we all have, and you guys have just done such an incredible job. I'd love to see more. You know, you guys just do a whole slew of them. So. <laughs> we'll keep it going, man. Appreciate it. That's really wonderful. I thank you. Um, you know, you mentioned that there's obviously more than the three of you on this. Do you want to give any shout-outs to people out there that, that helped? Uh, who, who else helped you on this that you'd like to mention? Um, I mean, there's a lot yeah. of people. Yeah, there's who, who shot some of them. Yeah, there's a, well, there's a couple of folks. I mean, it's like I'd like to give a shout-out to uh, Chris Dice. He's a Absolutely. guy that Tom and I work with a Mixed lot. The movie. He basically uh, did a lot of the audio post on the movie insofar as the mixing of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Tom, anybody you want to give a shout-out to? Oh yeah, there was David Bunce was there like nonstop for five years. Who who played the you know Daniel, uh, who and, and and yeah, and uh, you know that's the one that sort of jumps out at me. You know, as the yeah. as a, a real solid rock, and also Marion up Marion uh, Sue yeah, yeah. Sue the beauty who plays Marion yeah. yeah, it was great. No, there's a lot of a lot of good performances, and and uh, and Ron Kamara who played. Well, I'm gonna and, have to say Ron after that. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know. Of course, um, it's a uh, it's a dangerous road to go down too, because then you you want to name everybody, and it's easy to forget. <laughs> True. In the middle of an interview. And, True. Well, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, you guys have more questions for these guys? Joe? Yeah, I was gonna say the, the actor playing Daniel Upton sometimes had to have a beard and sometimes was clean shaved. Did you have any problems doing that over a five year period? Well, the the well, wrap the, the, Oh my God! Yeah, the, the, we shot we shot the, the the beard and the no beard all happened in his uh, in the wraparounds and sort of the storytelling looking back. Like he'd um, just totally given up and and just let age yeah. and life just. Let himself go. No, and we intentionally we intentionally wanted him to have a beard at the start of it and then shave it off during the movie. Um, you know, at a certain point, it sort of also helped us uh, sort of give a sense to the viewer how you know he was spending more than a he'd been there for a while. Yeah. And the wraparound was actually that was the that was the you know we wanted to have a different look for that we wanted to shoot that all at once. All the narrations, generally speaking, that's, you know, basically to have a different look. Uh, and also, you do get a sense of passage of time, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the other movie you talked about, did you say that was going to be a short film? And you're thinking of loading up, maybe? Exactly. Uh, what? Do you have any time, kind of timeline in mind, or just when well, it happens, it happens? We're close. I don't know what I can't say. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot. Well, we're actually, we're, we're, you know, if it, if it ends up just being a short film, we're going to be finishing principal photography close to this week. You know, we're, we have three shoot days next week. You know, that we're uh, finishing up a big chunk of it. And, uh, yeah, who knows what happens. Maybe that version, who knows, maybe that version will be at the, the Lovecraft Festival in Portland this year. Oh, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, the good, yeah, the good thing about that is if it's at the Lovecraft Festival in Portland, it means that I'll be in Portland. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Now, were you guys, I love Portland. Were you guys uh, into Lovecraft before you started filming the thing on the doorstep, or did that happen because of this, or have you always been interested in well, I mean, I was introduced to it from Will, but I started to read all the stories, so... Um, so you became a fan. Yeah, so, right. Yeah, Will was the, the impetus, and Will was the one that sort of brought it to us. Prior to that, I really did not know. I didn't know much about Lovecraft at all, and uh, certainly have uh, gained an interest in him and his stories, you know, from the producing of this movie. But, so, you know, sort of Will the one that's that, leading you down yeah. to this labyrinth of madness, in other words. Yeah. Yeah. Hey man, I try to do it by part. So many ways I can tell you. Okay, good to know. Um, okay, anything else we want to ask these guys? Do you, you have a tentative title for the new film? <laughs> yes, we do. Well, we have a working title. Title. Yes, a working title. title is a working title. Yes, <laughs> it's called the outage so far. Yeah, dealing with a power outage. <laughs> 
<laughs> you just keep asking her questions. She'll tell you the whole thing. I'll tell you everything you want to know. You haven't have a copy of the script on you that you can read. <laughs> Here, let's do a dramatic reading right now. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, guys, um, thanks for being on the show. I Thank really you. appreciate Bye. it. Everybody. You know, Mike, I just want to say, too, uh, you know, because I know everybody out there that's watching, uh, we want to say thanks to you, man, because you were, like, one of the first guys to carry the torch for the movie. Yeah, uh, way cool. When we first basically, you know, finished post-production on it, um, you and I kind of, you know, I got a hold of you, and, you know, you've been really supportive all the way around, so I just want to say it's really cool that, you know, now we're hitting DVD, etc. but, you know, that's kind of where things started, so just want to say thanks for the support Thank right back at the beginning, yeah. even, you know? Absolutely. It's it's a wonderful film. It really is. Thanks, man. Yeah, thanks for that. But I, I it, you guys did a great job, and uh, you know, everybody watching. I hope you download it from Amazon and watch it tonight or this week because you'll enjoy it. Um, so here's what we'll do. We're gonna talk about uh, some other stuff here, and I will randomly pick someone in a little while, pick three people, I'll use random.org to pick three people uh, to win DVDs of the film and I'll send those names to to Will and he can send them out. Does that sound okay, Will? Perfect. It will happen. Okay. No problem. Anything you guys want to say about the film before we close? Did we cover it all? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well thanks. Um, Hopefully we'll uh, have something else for you soon. Yeah, yeah. exactly. We'll keep in touch. Okay. Sounds great. You guys are welcome to stick around, or if, if you want to, all you got to do is X out the window, I think, and I'll, uh, I'll I'm gonna email you. I need, to go take, I need to go put my kids to bed. All right, man. Thanks. <laughs> That's <you>. my excuse. <laughs> nice. Take care, you guys. Thanks very much. Nice. Thanks, guys. Talk to you soon, I'm sure. We're going to cut out, too, but, Mike, thanks for everything, and uh, we'll do it again. Thanks, Will. I'll talk to you soon, man. Sounds good. All right, so now we're going to talk about all this uh, drama with Permuted Press, and uh, more importantly, I think, um, you know, what's a good, what should an author look for in a um, contract with their publisher? Uh, you guys have more experience with this than me. Um, first of all, I guess my first question is, <sighs> There's a lot of people that seem to be pretty angry about the permuted press thing. Um, I don't know how many, how much you guys have paid attention to this, um, but is this, does this seem to be, are they mad for a good reason, or is there two sides of this story, or what's the deal? Nobody knows. Well, or nobody wants to say. I, I don't know it in depth, you know. Um, I know what I've read, and and, and what I've, I've read a little, not a ton. Yeah. Yeah, same here. I, all all I really know is this: that it seems like a if I'm interpreting what I've seen on Facebook correctly and blogs and everything, that Permuted's got contracts with a bunch of authors, authors, and they suddenly decided that uh, these authors thought their books would be coming out in print, and they're not. They're going to be eBooks only. Um, is that specified in a contract that the medium it's going to appear in, Pete? Um, okay. My contracts always say both. And I, I, I make sure of that. Um, yeah, Norm, all, all, all the contracts I've had state that they are buying this right and that right, not that right or this right. It, it, it says what they're buying. Yeah, but that's different from saying that they're going to actually right. And but I I always have make sure that I get some sort of print run listed in the contract, even if it's a token print run. The other feeling I got, Laird Laird linked to I think two days ago he linked to um, one of their contracts that somebody had posted part of it online, and. Um, I think the gist of it is is that what they're doing is pissing a bunch of authors off, but it's not illegal in terms of the contract. No. 
It, I mean, and the, the contract's written that way. They have every right to do it. Whether it's right is correct or not in terms of keeping their stable of authors happy is a whole other thing. Which yeah, you know, okay, here it is. I just pulled it up. Talk about stable. Talk about stable of authors. What, Sorry. Joe? Go ahead, Joe. I'm I'm also under the impression from the little bit I saw that there were some people who the the print publication was imminent, and this came out of the blue when people were expecting in two weeks or three weeks the print copies would be available. Right. So this was a, a sudden change of plan and it may well be by the numbers legal but well you know me I'm, I'm always fair. much more interested in moral than legal um, but of course we have I mean, personally that is. Mm -hmm. So here's an email uh, let's see who is this person uh, here's a blog. I don't see a name here, but they they posted the email from from Muted Press. Uh, 2014 has been an amazing year for us here at Permuted. Let's see, skip, skip, skip. Now in 2014 alone, we've already published just over 100 titles. While we're thrilled at the response, our staff has been burning the candle at both ends, pulling it all together. Uh, we're exhausted. Okay, number one, we will be ceasing the production of print-on-demand books. Exceptions may be made for top sellers or for works we subjectively choose. Uh, our data revealed that 41.65% of our production team's time is spent making print-on-demand versions of our books, but these products account for only 7.41% of our income. Two, we are pausing the release of most new titles until early 2015. I imagine that pissed a lot of authors off. Um, this will grant us the time necessary to increase margin in our production schedule. Three, when publishing... Okay, that's not pertinent. Four... Okay, those are the, those are the two big things. We are not insensitive to the fact that these changes may have far-reaching effects on our authors. If you feel these changes will hinder the goodwill of our working together moving forward, we invite you to contact us directly via email. Um, so, I guess long story short, it did piss off a lot of authors. Uh, well, I gotta wonder, you say stable of authors, a lot of times for these small presses, this is the first book or the only venue they have for a commercial <laughs> publisher, you know what I mean? It's yeah. not like they've got lots of choices. So it's they, they probably had the upper hand to do this with impunity and not necessarily lose submissions, you know what I mean? Well, there are some good authors in that in that um in that list. Peter Kleins. Yeah, I was about to say Peter. Yeah. Is in there. Um, I think D. L. Snell is in there. Um, let me pull it up. Uh, here's part of the contract too that I'm looking at. Um, uh, actually, let me post it in here for you guys on the show. Um. Rob Fox. What's that? Rob Fox is a decent writer. Um, they're heavy on the zombie fiction, but you know that's all right if it if it's paying. Um, and they do a lot of Lovecraftian stuff. Um, yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. I'm disappointed. They they were the ones who did. Um, didn't they do uh, the uh, Thulu Unbound series? Yeah, they did. Yeah. Title. Um, down one, two, and three. So right. This, this blogger ends with, however, you need to realize that Permuted is acting entirely within their legal and contractual rights to fuck you over. There's a lesson to be learned here. If you don't don't want to be fucked by a contract, don't sign one. Um, you know, uh, as much as I like Peter Kleins, it's like, but what leverage do the authors have? You know, the a lot of these are they write. Small titles that they rely on a press like this for sales. Yeah. Okay. So that's my, my first do. question: Is this it? Looking over this contract, and I'm not a lawyer, but uh, me to me, and a bunch of other people have said this. It does look like a pretty crappy contract. 
Um, I mean, is that why, is that why a lot, a lot, a lot of of because you just trust that they do the right thing? Or? A lot of beginning writers give away things, sign things that they, in a perfect world, they should because mm -hmm. they have limited outlets or only one outlet. So it sometimes the question of do you want, let's say it's your first book, how badly do you want it out there? How badly do you want to be read? I mean, that's, that's the decision that a, a writer has to make when they're confronted, when they finally have a con contract put in front of them read it and decide, you know, then you go back to the publisher and say, oh, I don't like that part, or can you take that out? And there's the negotiations commence. Well, and if you are a first-time author and this is your first contract, I imagine it's extremely scary to say something like, I don't like this, let's take that out. You yeah, know? most first time. You're not, you're not going to say it, perhaps. Yeah, but yeah. can I... Yeah. The, the, the problem I have is the letter, the email. Mm -hmm. It's been a fabulous year. But. But let's screw you over. <laughs> I mean, how good could it have been if you're going to stop doing this and not send me a personal email? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's almost like you sh they shouldn't have said it's a fabulous year. They should have said it's been a crappy year, therefore we have to do this. Exactly. When you start off with it's been a fabulous year, we're doing great, uh, then me as the author, I'm thinking, okay, awesome, what's coming? You know, Oh, it's negative. Yeah. It just doesn't make any sense to me to, to phrase it that way. Um, yeah, I agree. The other thing is, you're going to tell me this publisher didn't know this was coming? There weren't conversations that went on for X amount of time beforehand, and then things were established? So like I said, you have a handful of authors, at least a handful from what I saw, who were expecting their book to be on the street in print. By Christmas. Imminently. So you couldn't... As, as as a fair-minded publisher, you couldn't say, hey, look, things are bad here. We're, we know you expect your books coming out in a month in print. We're not going to be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah, Gabrielle. I mean, how about a little fairness? How about saying, you know, we're still going to put the ebook out, but we'll be happy to give you back your print rights. Something. I think you know? that's the problem with that these authors have. And again, I don't want to speak out of school because I don't know everything, but Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like they're saying, okay, we're only going to be doing the e-books. However, we're not going to give you your print rights back, even though we're not going to print it. Right. I mean, I did think that there was a, a, a – I saw an email or a posting from one of the publishers, and I did hear somewhere in that letter that said, if this doesn't work for you, contact us, and maybe you can work something out. Yeah. But, you know. it. It's still, you know, at, at the very least, they should let the print rights go back after a right. time. Yeah, like that's what I said. Yeah. Um, the bottom line is, even if, if one doesn't know all the details, if, if your authors, if the vast majority of your authors are suddenly unhappy, you can't be, do you must be doing something wrong with that decision, whatever the decision was. Well, you know, here, here's what I'm thinking about right now, and, and you're right, Mike, but I'm going to reverse that. Mm -hmm. You know, if I have a contract with, with a publisher to release my books, and I'm a month late with the, with the delivery, I'm in violation of my contract. Right. And you're pissed off at me, and my distributor's pissed off at me because... Everything's not falling in line now. Now, let's. I'm now. I'm looking at it from the publisher doing this. Well, there are people who booked conventions, you know, prepaid for books, mm -hmm. you know, pre-orders, all this stuff. They're not sure if they're going to get them. 
Yeah, Gabriel Faust, isn't that her last name? I believe was talking about that. Yeah, I, you know, that would really tick, you know, if I'm walking into a convention thinking that I'm going to have a case of books to sell, and then all of a sudden I'm not even going to get that. And let's say let's say they are let out of their contract because of this. And now all of a sudden, as the author, now I've got a book that I thought had a publisher. Now it doesn't have a publisher. Right. And uh, now I've got to go find a new publisher. Six yeah, months. Yeah, that can even happen. You know, I've, I'm so happy. I'm a beginning author. I found a publisher. You know, my wife's proud of me. I'm going to get my book published. And all of a sudden, no, it's not. It's not like I haven't been through this because I went through it. With my I know. And it's it's happened to me too. But yeah, I, I mean I have a real problem right now with, with and I like some of their stuff. I have it on my shelves. But I'm torn. Well they're they're really if nothing else if we can get nothing else out of this as far as permuted is concerned, I think we can all agree that they're really hurting their reputation. And that's not a good thing. I don't understand it because, you know, POD is cheap. Oh, yeah. What's this? Yeah. Oh, it's too expensive to do POD? What? I'm poor, man. I'm doing POD. What the hell are you talking about? I, I don't get it. You know, it actually gives you a physical... We talked about it earlier with the DVD. It's mm -hmm. a physical product. So, some people want a physical product. Right. And if anything, what I've learned in the weird fiction, and, and Matt's the perfect example of this, there is a fetish attached with having a physical copy of these books. Mm -hmm. Fetish? It's, yeah. Yes. Just because I, I sit here naked surrounded by my books. No, well, we don't want to hear about that. Books, mister. <laughs> you also can get it signed by the author. Yeah. That, yeah. You know, and that cuts both ways. Is if I'm gonna if I'm gonna see somebody, I want to get something signed, preferably their latest piece or their mm. first piece, whatever. But if there's nothing, I'm probably not gonna waste my time. So to to flip this around and maybe get something positive out of this uh, for all the authors out there, you guys have a lot of experience, and I think what you have to say is really valuable. Um, what should a author be looking for in a publisher? I'll, I'll, I'll say one thing, I'm going to turn it over to you guys, but as a, well I've been a publisher of a magazine for four years now, but as a, as a new publisher of books, I wouldn't want anyone signing a contract with me, how do I want to phrase this, that doesn't, that wouldn't trust me enough without signing the contract. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's going to be contracts on all my books, but if, if you don't trust the person to begin with, you don't trust the, the company to begin with. I mean, does that make sense? I mean, I, I, there's got to be a trust level there that's not just bound by the contract itself. Yeah, but, okay, so I, I work for the government. I'm sorry. I'm here to screw you over, with or without the contract. Mm -hmm. But, no, but I've been a contract manager. I manage multi-million dollar contracts. All, all the time, and you know, I have seen the stupidest things be left out of contracts, mm -hmm. and I've seen the stupidest things put into contracts, and they've been held against us or for us. Yeah, we, absolutely, and that's that you're making my point for me because if I left something out of a contract that hurt my author and it was just some oversight, right? You know, I would. I would put that in, even though it's already been signed. I I would make that up to my author. There's a trust. There's a trust factor there. It can't be just limited to the contract itself. Well, you signed this, therefore we can do this. You know, I mean, come on, man. Right. Um, and we've all we've all signed contracts where we love you, baby. You're the greatest. This is wonderful. You sign the contract, and then you never hear from anybody. Right. Um. You yeah. have to know before you put your pen on that paper that that's not going to happen. Yeah, it's it, it, it's it's definitely a buyer beware situation. Um, you're ex if 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 it's your first thing, you're excited, you know. Um, uh, they're probably excited, which further excites you, 
and have you done your homework? That's one of the first, most important things is how, how it's not just who they are. How are they perceived? Um, have you ever heard a complaint about them? If you do a little internet research, do you see good comments about the publisher? Have you, are there any bad ones at all? And if so, are they from anybody, I don't want to say important, but, but are they real concerns and complaints, or, or, or are they trollish? Hey, yeah, and talk to other authors. Um, before we continue, I want to point out to everybody watching, if you don't know, if you have questions or you want to chime in on this discussion, uh, we do have a message board that we keep an eye on during these, these chats. It's on Facebook. If you don't know about it, just go to Facebook, type in Lovecraft Easing Public Message Board, and ask to join, and I will add you. So if you got questions um, for these guys, throw them out there. If you're permuted, press author. Yeah. Uh, all right, so what, what should an author be looking for? What's some concrete things they should be looking for besides trust, and, which is abstract? I mean, what um, do you guys look for before you I sign look, a contract? What I do you have to have? I look for what's going to, what makes the contract expire. Okay. I, look, I look for a minimum print run. And these are for my novels. For my anthologies, you know, I'm not really that that concerned about. Um, I know which authors are going to do full print and which ones are going to do mix and which ones are just going to do ebook. That's obvious. Right. So, Pete, talk to the talk to the authors out there who are writing a novel and do tell them what you look for in a contract. What you won't sign your you won't sign your name before you have these things. Um. Every contract, you know, contracts have been difficult lately because, you know, the market is changing, and that is a huge, what do I want to say, excuse for everything. And I'm sure mm -hmm. Joe hears this a lot. Oh, the market's changing. We can't afford to pay you this. We can't afford to pay you that. And then you say, well, then I can't afford to pay the, you know, sign the contract. And then all of a sudden there's a counteroffer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, um... I always look for an expiration date or conditions for when those rights revert back to me. When do I get my property back if you're going to screw me over somehow? When when is that in general? In general, you know, it because of ebooks and whatnot, um, and print on demand. It used it, it it's changed, but what basically what it comes down to is if if they don't sell a book in in six months. They, I can demand the rights back, or or three months. You you can set the time period. Um, yeah. Used to be that you know they would have to do a print run. Well, now a print run is ten books. Yeah. So that's not really a huge issue anymore. Which is back to to the issue is I don't understand how the POD is a problem. Because um, they don't they don't want to pay they don't want they don't want to pay twice to build the book, to set the book with the printer. Yeah. It's, a diff it, it's difficult. It's different technical specifications for an e-book and a print book. Right. You're paying some print-on-demand place X amount of dollars, and you're, they also do e-books. So you're paying them X amount of dollars for the other version. Right. They're, they're trying to cut their costs. I have some questions from the audience, guys. My, my problem is, is they had to know this was coming. Right. They mm -hmm. they already know what writers they have in their stable who expect books are out here, here, and here. And in a would seem to me logical in a short period of time, fully well knowing those books won't materialize, they make this decision and don't immediately notify the authors and do something about that. They like, it, it's skullduggery. They're trying to hide it until they have to let the cat out of the bag, and at that point, those people have no option. Because uh, their contract is legal. Yeah, uh, okay, so I, 
What else? I got two questions from the from the audience. What else? What else do you? All right, rights. You mm -hmm. don't sell film rights. You don't sell translation rights. Um, you know, a, a publisher has, has got nothing to do with trans. If your book is going to be sold to El Supremo in Portugal, the publisher does You know, and and the book came out from Kill Ugly Radio Press in the U.S. Kill Ugly Radio Press has got nothing to do with translating this book. So why do they get that piece? Movie rights. Yeah. Kill Ugly Radio Press has got nothing to do with making a film. So yeah, that's why the there. Rebecca, um, I recently submitted to a market where there was a heated debate about this. The publisher was asking not only for print slash ebook slash audiobook rights, but also film and video game rights. Some people thought this was over overstepping bounds. Others suggested that because it was stated up front, it shouldn't be a deterrent. You never get away. It's nice of the publisher to say it up front, but the publisher's got to say it up front when they hand you a contract anyway. So that's no big deal. Um, yeah, audio rights. Publishers more than entitled to buy audio rights, as well as print and ebook rights. But again, translation rights has got nothing to do with your primary English American publisher. Film rights have nothing to do with your American publisher. Nor do video game rights. In, in fact, if film rights were sold, your American publisher, who probably still has the rights to your book, if the film does happen and it's good and it makes money and gets noticed, that publisher is going to get a bump in sales. Mm -hmm. So why are you going to give them a second piece of the pie when they're not doing anything? Yeah, how greedy do they have to be? You know, uh, um, Henry Lopez says, uh, asks, what should a writer look for in a contract? What clauses should send up red flags? Well, like Pete said, when when's the end date? When is your when's the start date? You know, is, is this the, does your contract say that the book will be published within six months, within one year? Within three years, um, when do you get your rights back should things go wrong? What rights do, does this publisher want? And how much are they paying you? Those are the primaries. Okay, so here's you know? a question the beginning author might have. Do, do any of them, with, with small publishing, my, it's probably no usually, but do they get anything up front, or is it usually royalties? What is it? How does the author get paid? What's normal? Oh, okay. Uh, an author may or may not receive an advance. Uh, an advance might be a, a, an advance against a, a preliminary advance against royalties. That might be a little bit. It might be a fairly good sum. Nowadays, with small press, it's it's not a big sum in general. Um, it's certainly going to tell you what your royalty, the contract is going to tell you what your royalty is, but you don't start earning royalties until your book has earned back its production money. So if it costs, let's just throw a number up in the air. Let's say it costs a small press publisher $2,000 to release your book. Mm -hmm. Between cover art and built in and, and, and all the various things. So, it, until you've sold enough, when the book finally comes out, until you've sold enough copies to recoup that $2,000, you won't see any royalties. You know, that, that's one of the reasons why authors want an advance. You know? Um, what happens, even if you write a great book, you can write a great book that doesn't sell. You know, um, that, that certainly happened historically more than once. Um, but do authors usually, do first time authors usually get an advance with small press? Depends the small press. 
and and also I would say that amount of money is less and less now than it used to be and the yeah you know, it, it all depends on the press the people you're dealing with yeah should you expect one um yeah I think that's what I'm asking more than anything I would say that depends on the press um Rick do you want to weigh in uh, no, not really, because I mainly, uh, and I don't get advances, I get royalties. Right, okay. So I don't have to worry about production costs. So what's a typical royalty for in a small press, for the author, I mean? Um, yeah, it, it varies, you know, there's, there's one price for, um, hard, you know, paperbacks, one price for hardcovers, one price for trade paperbacks, and mm -hmm. one price for ebooks, and all of that is negotiable. They'll tell yeah. you that it's not, but it is. Mm -hmm. yeah, and there's different schools of thought on what your royalty should be for print versus ebook. You know, I mean, at one point, at one point, uh. It used to be a publisher shouldn't get more than ten or fifteen percent of ebook sales. Um, you know, so uh, royalty payments—that's uh, it varies and it's negotiable. Another thing that should be in the contract is when. When do you get an accounting, and when are your royalties paid? Are they paid every month? Are they paid every quarter? Are they paid every six months? Do you get an accounting one, once a year and get paid if any money is due to you? Um, that should be in the contract. Yeah. If your publisher do has a bad day and forgets to do an accounting, um, uh, do you have to submit something in writing to get an accounting? If you're published, you know, um, the first and most important thing before you even get to the contract phase is snoop around. If if public or this permutated press thing is, is going to be is is making news, so let's say they get it all worked out and everything's hunky dory. So two years from now, anybody can look back and go, "Oh, look, this, these guys weren't too good over here," and this is why what mess was. Do a little research, find out who this publisher is. Look at a publisher's roster. Have these authors been published? Um, let, let's pick on a publisher, and not in a negative way. Let, let's say Hippocampus Press. Hippocampus Press has published John Langan and Simon Stranzis and Richard Gabb. And, and we can list some others. These are notable writers. It's like, okay, um, odds are that's a pretty good press to start getting that kind of writer in as, as part of their roster. That's an excellent point. Uh, and then I so think, it's what about like the guy who looked at Peter Klein's at Permuted Press and said, well, Peter's here, it must be good. I mean... Yeah. Yeah, well, okay, you know, if you've got one, and I don't know any of these writers, mm -hmm. so let's say this, this particular writer is a bunch where most of us don't know their name. Okay, um... Is Peter Klein's on Facebook? And we're not picking on him, but we'll just use him. It's like, yeah. oh, look at his page. See what he has to say. Is is he happy camper? Um, again, it, it's, it's a little bit of research to find out who you're dealing with. Because um, perhaps you're in Wisconsin and they're in New York. So you can't meet them for lunch and, and get a sense of who they are. Um, 
you know, uh, re research is really important. Uh, what do you guys think about? And, the, and and one other quick thing is yeah, go ahead. You can join the HWA and get access to all kinds of uh, technical stuff. You know, they have like sample contracts for for members to look at and stuff, and they have all kinds of recommended guidelines. So there are places out there where you can find out things. As as far as you know, this is a standard boilerplate. Uh, um, contract. You, these things are acceptable normally. These things are not acceptable normally. There is information out there, but it may require some digging. So, what do you guys? What's your answer? This 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 one blogger that I I sent you the link. He seems to be saying, look, it's a crappy contract over at Permuted. And you authors have only yourselves to blame because you signed it. So well, that's a crappy, that's a crappy thing for the guy to say. Yeah, because that's the way I, We I, don't I, know. I don't let's, let's say Penny Carpenter signed one of those contracts, okay? Mm -hmm. And she's a first-time author. Let's say she wrote this novel, okay? And she thought it's, 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 a, it's a vampire versus not, not zombies novel. And she thought it would fit there, and she submitted it, and they accepted it. Mm -hmm. And so she's a first-time novelist. She gets this thing back saying, "We'd love to talk. We'd lo really love your novel. We'd like to talk to you about um, publishing it." She is happy, and she deserves to be. Okay, so she says sure, and they send her a contract, and she's never seen one. She doesn't know. She's really happy. It's her first dance, and without doing research, she signs it, thinking, "Okay, this is a publisher, and you know they want to sell books, um, so you know they're gonna they're gonna do what they tell me they're gonna do," and right. she goes along with it. Okay, is she guilty of n not doing research? Maybe she's guilty of being fooled. But that doesn't make her wrong. Um, you know, first-time writer, Pete can tell you what it's like your first dance. I can tell you what it's like your first dance. It's exhilarating. And it ought to be exhilarating. You worked hard for this. You worked... This is not... Yes, this is fun. But it's not easy. It's a lot of work. And if anybody out there doesn't believe that this is tough, then then, then don't try it because you're going to fail. It's hard work, and, and you've got to want to bleed to get there. Um, when yeah, you finally get, get an invitation to dance, you know? when you finally get an invitation to the dance, that's a great thing. Um, and hopefully you're smart enough, and hopefully you fall in with the right people, and you get a good contract. But a lot of people have been taken. Any one of us here could tell a hundred horror stories that we've heard. And some of us here can tell you a whole bunch of horror stories that we saw close and personal or were part of. Um, just like anything else, not everything is fair. There are sharks in the water. Um, well, you know, the the question is often at you know I, I do talks on how do I get my book published and this and that, and I, I relate my experience. But yeah. I, I ask the question often: what's the, what is the the job? What's the goal of a publishing company? And the answer I always get back is to publish books. And my response is no. No. The job is to make money. Make money like any other company. So if they can, first of all, I would never take the contract as written. I don't care if it's if it's changing one one word just to make yourself happier. 
say no to the, the, to the first version and send them revision. Even if well, you would be perfectly happy. Let, let's stop right there because I, don't, I do not disagree with you, Pete. However, there is some small press publishers out there that, yeah, if they make money, they're happy, but that's not really their goal. That's not why they're doing it. Uh, and yet they're utter professionals. Uh, yeah, I agree. I agree with you. But in, in general, most presses are aren't in it for the love. Right. Yeah. 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 They they have they have to make money somehow. Um, and if they can squeeze a couple extra bucks out of you for getting some licensing or um, paying you cheaper, they will. And they will send you the worst possible contract the first time out. And who, who, when you say that, who are you talking about? Are you talking about small, small press, or are you talking about the big, big guys? I think, I think most small. Or are you press talking press. about everybody? I'm talking about really everybody. Everybody will send you their boilerplate contract to see if you'll sign it, because it's in their best interest. I don't know about everybody. I know a couple of people I've worked with that are uh, real good folks, and I, I'd recommend them to anybody. Nah. They, they you know, started right. I, I mean, yes, they're interested in making money, but yeah. they are also complete professionals, and they are out to establish a relationship with a writer they want to work with and hopefully continue to work with. I now that is not that is not most people. That's a couple that I know of. Yeah. And, and I agree with you. I, I agree with you, Joe. Yeah. But in general, the, ch the chances of you stumbling onto those people, and I think I know who you're talking about. I'd rather be telling people to err on the side of caution. Oh yeah. And. Question everything in the contract, and if you don't like something, send revisions. And if they don't like it, they'll send it back with a revision. And you can negotiate. It might take you a couple weeks. And you can always pick up the phone and say, this is what I'm concerned about. For writer, author. No. So ask questions. Say, I don't understand this. Um, I, I was under the impression it should be 10%. They should know and understand that as a first timer looking at that contract that you got questions, you have concerns, and if you raise anything and they're not nice about it, then there's a big warning sign. A publisher that's really interested and is going to be somebody good to work with is not going to be at all bothered by your questions. No. They are they not going to anything to hide. Yeah, that's it. They're they're professional. They want a good working relation, professional relationship with you. So questions. There's nothing wrong with a question. Um, you know, uh, I, I feel like Bermuda Press is taking the short term here and not the long term. Um, perhaps they did. We're not behind the curtain, so. Yeah. Um, and and I don't know the press other than I've heard the name. <coughs> I have some Can of their books. The question, guys, um, is an advance preferable to a higher royalty? No. Yes. Depends on what yeah. you want. Yes. Yeah. Because there's there's no guarantee your book will sell no matter how good it is. So getting the biggest advance possible up front. Yes. She if also wants to know if you share about the, uh, the good uh, publisher. Publishers you're talking about. Right. Um, I don't but, see anything about it, I guess. But it might be a really good small press who can't afford to pay mm -hmm. uh, much and advance, but they may be able to give you a huge royalty provided your book sells. So they're going to spend all the money to produce your book, and if it sells, after production costs are recouped, then you start getting your royalties. Uh, it depends on the 
a lot of these questions are it depends. You know? the, the, other, the other thing was in advance. You better have the book ready because if you get an advance and you don't have to finish the book, you don't have a deadline and you better be able to meet it. Yeah. Well, again, you know, once, once you're looking at contracts and you're entering negotiations, you're a professional. They're supposed to be professional. You're supposed to be professional. Yeah, there's a... And when, and when they're not professional or you're not professional, that gets around. There's a story I was told a couple of years ago after I sold the, the reanimators. Uh, it was... I won't mention the pro's name, but he was talking about... He was uh, telling his, his um, agent that he was going to be a couple months late with the newest book. Mm-hmm. And the, the agent said, okay, um, who's your publisher of this book? And he rattled off the name. And he says, who do you think the publisher of your next book is going to be? Yeah. yeah. And the implied threat was that, you know, you're going to screw over your publisher, and they're not going to get your next book. So, so what about, um, now let's, 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 let's face it, most, a, a lot of, especially in Lovecraftian subgenre and weird fiction, uh, most authors are going to be dealing with small press. Okay, yeah, yeah. nothing wrong with that. I mean, I mean, if it wasn't for small press, there's a lot of hellaciously good books and collections that would not exist. Uh, but the question is, since it is small press, what about promotion? I mean, that's another thing. As an author, you have to what? What can this small press? How are they going to promote my book? Most small presses nowadays do not. Exactly, and that's what I was about to say. The book Most comes out, and it's sink or swim. If you go to Facebook, you see Joe Pulver trying to sell his book. You see other people trying to sell their books. Cthulhu They're, sells. Read the weird company. You know, we are our own promotion vehicles nowadays. If you have an agent, hey, rules can change. If you have the right publisher, some publishers actually promote and do it very well. Uh, Michael Kelly at Undertow is is a very active editor and publisher and does a marvelous job presenting his product to the public. Ross Lockhart with Word Horde, marvelous editor who does a wonderful job of presenting his product to the public. These two guys, and I'm just picking those two guys out, there are other really good ones. They are the exception, not the rule. But there's very good small press publishers who do everything right. It just They're such small operations, they don't promote. You know? That's yeah, I mean, an awful lot of them in weird fiction and Lovecraft, they... <laughs> They're asking me to promote their books. And right. Well, okay. And again, when you're talking about a Lovecraftian writer who wants to enter into the game, mm -hmm. I would suspect that this Lovecraftian writer knows a bit about the community. They certainly read Lovecraft, but I would say nowadays have, you don't know names like, I don't know, Baron, Pugmire, Rollick, we could name off a whole bunch of other Lovecraftian writers. Where did these guys get published? Um, where do you see their stories? Where do you see their collections? Where do you see their novels? Um, so if, if these are writers you see frequently in good anthologies and whatnot, where, where are these books being published? Because at, if they're Lovecraftian or attached to Lovecraftian and you see Pete Rollick coming out in Chaosium books. Okay, there's a marketplace. If you see Laird Barron here, there's a marketplace. Go do your research. It's easy to see, you know, where are Willem's books being published by? Where is this guy's being, books being published by? Um, what handful of publishers uh, seem to well serve the Lovecraftian community? And, and right. that's where they look. When you go to, uh, I don't know, East Tentacle Press, 
and they've put out six books, and you've never heard of three new writers, and they're in, um, you know, I don't know, Kill Ugly Radio, Alabama. Why are we for crying out loud? You know? You just stole everybody in Alabama. I'm not picking on Alabama. Well, right been, now, somebody's, somebody's right. Right now, somebody's uh, buying the URL "Kill Ugly Radio" for the it, URL. It, it's a Frank Zappa thing. Um, the other thing too is there are a lot of Lovecraftian writers in social media. They got Yahoo's yeah. like that hack Rollick. You got Pugmire. You got a whole bunch. For the most part, these are friendly, approachable people. And if you want to be a nice guy and say, hey, I got a question. I was thinking of submitting here or something. You know, hey, who knows? We might, uh, <clears throat> we might, you know, if approached properly, we might talk to you. We might be busy and unable to as well. Um, but you have a many different avenues of research available. Mm -hmm. Take them. Explore them. This is, you know, if, if this was 1972 and, and you were wondering how to be, how to get your book published, it might be a little more difficult. You might have to spend a lot of time at the library. But now you just turn your computer on. And you can find out all kinds of stuff about all kinds of people, you know, you know, Kill Ugly Radio Press, Google it. Uh-oh, they're, they're not your friends, ladies and gentlemen, you know. Yeah, and I mean, asking other people, too. Uh, That's what I'm saying. Going you to conventions know. and asking people, that's a good way. Yeah. Not just sending someone to people that you don't know. Is, is at one point, Joe Pulver had a Lovecraftian novel. He had never published anything. He had never written anything but this stupid novel. And he went to a convention. And he sat there and listened to some panels. And one panel happened to have, I believe, as I recall, it was Bob Price, C.J. Henderson, Daryl Schweitzer, and I don't remember the other two people. And the panel was what editors look for in Lovecraft in stories, anthologies, and novels. And while they were talking, I had a manuscript under my chair, and I thought, oh, my novel's got that in it. Oh, my novel's got that. And afterward, when the opportunity presented itself, I approached Bob Price, and I introduced myself, and I explained to him what I had, and he went, sure, I'll read that. You know, um... Uh, I would like to think that, that the people who watch these video chats get a sense of that, you know, we're, we're pretty approachable, we're pretty nice in general. You know, we, we're often busy, so maybe it's a bad time, or and, and play nice if you kick us, but in general, we're, we're pretty good cats, uh, so... No, 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 wait. You're a good cat. I'm the asshole. Let's be no, clear. You're I'm you know, the Let's get the, the names right. I'll, I'll be right back, but I also want you to maybe do a reality check, Joe, and whoever else wants to pipe in about once you do get that first novel published or short story collection published, uh... You know, that's not, it, the, the step isn't you, you get it published, and then step two is you quit your day job. Because oh, no. most writers, no. uh, it's, it's not like that. So talk no. about that, you guys. I'll be right back. Well, you know, just, just to use an example, one of the things which Hurt Cole and with Wagner, he quit his day job, and he would get all these wonderful advances and uh, not meet deadlines, and that kind of really hurt his literary career. Hmm. Well, another thing is, too, is you you can, let's say you submit a story, bam, it gets accepted, and another one, and another one. You, you can sell a whole bunch of stories, 
And then all of a sudden you get a rejection and another and another. The tide goes in, the tide goes out. The currents change. Uh, the air pressure changes. Editors change. What publishers want changes. So just because you get on, it's, it's like baseball. You get on a hot streak. You're, you're batting whatever, Matt, give us a number, 500, is it? Um, and then all of a sudden you can't buy a hit. You know, markets come, new markets pop up, markets disappear. Um, do, do, you remember, do, you, do you remember Marietta Publishing? Yeah. Um, yes. They, they used to like be an outlet for C.J. Henderson mostly. I think it was yep. Bruce Gewiler. Is that Gewe the right way yeah, you pronounce it? That's right. He actually, he actually uh, made a sort of uh, sub career of selling how to publish your books. He oh, wrote, there's all kind. There's all kinds of books like that out there. Uh, it's just it's interesting. I just don't know if like what he wrote now is 20 years ago would have any applicability to today's market, though. Yeah. So but here's the example. Been people out there trying to help people publish. What 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 book do you have, Pete? So this is the uh, spring 1997 issue of Tailbones, which yeah. you know, back in the day was well respected. Yeah, it sure was. Gorgeous this is book. My, this is my first fiction professional sale, and I didn't sell anything else for ten years. Yeah. Nothing. I, I, mean, I know somebody, and I won't say any names, but X amount of time ago, they sold a story and pretty quickly sold another and pretty quickly sold another. And it didn't take very long where they had sold quite a few short stories. And they were thrilled, and they should have been thrilled. And then all of a sudden, they got a rejection, and it caught them, it blindsided them. Because it had been acceptance, 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 and they were on a roll. They were hot for all intents and purposes. Yep. And they're like, "Wow, I got rejected. I don't understand what happened." And then yeah. they got another one. You, you. This is this is the same as the music industry. Now, if you're lucky. And a lot of us have been lucky and met editors who like our work. So often when they have a project, we'll get invited kind of thing. Um, you know, but you can't count on that. You know, uh, editors change jobs. Uh, there's just so many reasons. Hell, editors die. Editors die. Editors go insane. The they, field. Editors also change their perspective. I mean, this, this is a Lovecraft chat. I mean, Lovecraft. How many stories did Lovecraft get rejected by Farnsworth Wright? Oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. now classic stories. Here's here's <laughs> Joe who's edited some Lovecraftian anthologies, and I see things, good things that I reject. Just because something's good doesn't mean it fits. Right. And, yeah. yeah. You it know? Maybe um, may too long. It could be too long. It could be too short. You, somebody could have given you a... a um, somebody could have given you a synopsis, and in essence, they wrote what they told you they were going to, but it came out different. Yeah. <laughs> It isn't what you thought it was going to be, and now it doesn't fit. Uh, um, Matt just typed on the side, and the audience can't see it. A good point. Tom Lynch had a very nice small press and changed jobs. Uh, you know, right. Dead but Dreaming is a classic. That uh, uh, the name of his publishing company just went out of my mind. What is it? Miskatonic River Press. See, River they Press. Had, it wasn't just Dead but Dreaming. They had a series of what I would have considered home runs mm -hmm. of brilliantly fun books. And I thought they were on a roll. And I was like, like well, really they looking were. forward to what the future. In one sense, I mean, they were, but they weren't making money, really. Well, Not you much. know, I mean, well, that's true. 
Uh, unfortunately, one of their books. Yeah, everybody and got burnt out, like, and I don't blame him one bit, you know, because look, publishing, being a small press publisher is a hard job. I mean, it really is. And after a while, you're not making any money, you're not making any money, you're like going, oh, what the fuck, man, you know? Yeah, but so. even life gets in the way, okay? Tom will probably kill me for this, okay? A season, well, in Carcosa, a season in Carcosa was the biggest seller they ever had. It sold very, very well. But just because it did, that doesn't matter, you know. Well, Christ, you attach Joe Pulver on something and... Oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a really important. Um, uh, everything is variable. All right, two things. Uh, if you want uh, the Thing on the Doorstep DVD, uh, and why wouldn't you, um, send me an email, lovecraftezine at gmail.com, and please put Thing on the Doorstep in the subject and in the body say something about, you know, well, I guess that's all you need to say, really. But anyway, it's Lovecraft Easing, Lovecraft Easy, I N E, at gmail.com. In a few minutes, I'll use random.org to announce the winners. Uh, second thing I want to say is speaking of small press, here is the very first print uh, oh, cool. publication from Lovecraft Easing Press. That's great. Right. Let's see here. There we go. Matthew, um, Matthew Carpenter wants to know when the slipcase leather bound edition with the <laughs> ribbon comes out. Well, that was all the typical on that. Um, it's, it turned out very, very nice. I'm very, very proud of it. Sea of Ash by Scott Thomas, um, covered by Nick Gucker with help by uh, uh, Leslie Harker, as usual. Um, and it's available. I just put it. I just linked to it on the message board. It's available in print, and it's also available uh, in Kindle. So please make Scott and me happy and buy it. But uh, more of the point. Look, I know I'm not going to get rich being a small press, um, and I'm not going to get rich selling this book. But I. This is the first print book for a reason. I think it's just it's utterly a fantastic story and my goal is yeah I'd like for Scott and I to make some money who who doesn't like money but my goal really is I really want to share this story with as many people as possible a lot more people that have that have seen it up till now so um, you know. so anyway all right any other do we need to say anything else about I don't know do they have any other questions I don't see any more. I mean, we must be good. We anticipate the question, you know. Kimberly <laughs> says this whole thing is making me nervous about seeking a publisher for my stuff. There was a question about, you know, uh, a flat rate fee. Okay, yeah, well, what was that? I must have missed that. You know, you know what about flat rate? And I, I prefer sometimes just to sell the story for, you know, a year or two and get paid and walk away. You know, I need yeah. some quick cash. So it depends on what you want. Yeah. Once you want to do this, once you have a product to sell, go research the market. That's the bottom line. If if you think you can get an agent. Go get an agent. An agent can be a very powerful, wonderful tool if you can get one. Yeah, Laird harps on that quite a bit. Um, Do you have an agent? The whole thing too is, is if you're going to get an agent, there's someplace else you need to research. Do you Do you have one, Joe? I'm I don't. But if you stop and think about me as a writer. I don't think I'm not I'm, criticizing. I was just—I didn't think you did. No, 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 no. I mean, think about what my stuff looks like. I'm, and this is not—I'm not speaking the quality here, but I'm like Cisco. I'm like Ligotti when he was starting. I'm uh, out there in left field. 
you know, um, I think I'm an acquired taste. I, I think Ligotti's an acquired taste. I, I think Cisco. There, there, there's X amount of writers out there, and I don't know that if we're, I don't know if how friendly you, we are, and, and I don't mean this. Re, it, it, it's almost like a readability thing. Some people don't want to do the work. They want a nice regular story. And Matt just made a good point. Yeah, they want Willem, some of them. Even Willem is one of those outsider writers. I can see where a lot of people... I mean, Willem has a lot of fans for good reason. But I can see where a lot of people would not like Willem. His writing. You know, it, it it's... He lives out there in that left field district with some of us others. We're... An acquired taste. Yeah, and um, you know what, Joe? That brings up a point that I really want to say about small press. Not just me, but all the small press out there that's been doing this for so long. You know, yeah, you're right, author. Small press may not be able to, they can't pay you as much as the big press. If you're lucky enough to get signed by Random House, God, do it. But you know, if it wasn't for small press, we wouldn't be reading Pugmire or Pulver or a lot of people. A lot of people. Gavin, Stranzis, Llewellyn. I, I, will, I will tell you that the majority of the really stunning work that's coming out is coming out via the small press. Yeah, exactly. All these hands are pretty that's well. Right. I Did like to support the small presses. Desire. I'm sorry, Matt. Well, I, I just like to support these small presses as much as possible because it means my favorite authors are going to write more. You know, that's exactly the way I look right. at it. There, there's, there's, there's a brilliant point is you buy that book, we might get to write something else. Another, another big thing that we've occasionally touched on here is write a review. Share a link. Tell you know. Tell all those people in Kill Ugly Radio, Missouri, that this is a great book because it's probably oh, Alabama and Missouri you've written off. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, is a lot of these small presses are not in brick and mortars. People don't see them. So, and you know, it's one thing to write love. something on your Facebook page or your blog and say, "I really enjoyed this book," and you know, we appreciate that. But the best, yes. thing, absolute best thing you can do is to write a positive, I mean, don't lie, but if you like the book, you want to see them continue, you like the story, write a positive review on Amazon. Because like it or not, however anyone feels about Amazon or not, that's where a lot of decisions are made about whether a book is bought or not online. And yep. people look at those reviews, they look at those stars, um, and they make a decision on that. You know? And the other thing that, that's directly tied to that is Willem Pugmeyer and Joe Pulver and Pete Rollick and Livia Llewellyn and all these writers, let's say, that you like, they have bad days. They have days of self-doubt. And all of a sudden a review pops up where somebody said, I really enjoyed this book. Yeah. You know what? You're helping us write the next story because you just gave us fuel to rebuild the fire. Not only that, um, you're keeping an editor going and you're keeping a small press going that sometimes it gets up and wonders, why am I doing this? I sure as hell am not making any money. Yeah. But then they see that review and they, they think, oh, that's why I'm doing this. You know? So as hokey you know, as it may sound. And the other thing, too, is if, if you wonder why this writer isn't bigger or more popular... More, the more positive reviews and stuff, editors see who get who's liked by readers. Editors, yes, most editors, this one in particular, um, picks people for projects because that person will work. But there's a whole lot of editors out there who want, who once they start seeing names, it's like, oh, people like him. People like that. People like that. Then you, 
you're helping that particular writer to be noticed in other places. Um, a review does a whole lot of things you might imagine. Yep. Um, Matt reminded me just now, thanks Matt, to talk about the Halloween show this year. Uh, speaking of Scott Thomas, on Thursday, October the 30th at uh, 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time, um, day before Halloween, we're going to do, I've been doing a annual Halloween show every year, and I'll have Scott on and his brother Jeff on. Uh, Jeff's an author too, and I assume everybody in the world knows that. If, if they don't, they should. Um, and we're talking about Halloween stuff, and it's always a great, fun show to get everybody in the mood for Halloween. So again, that's October the 30th, a live show just like this with these guys. Uh, 8 o'clock, or yeah, 8 o'clock Eastern Time. So, should be a lot of fun. So, um, anyway, did we cover everything? I think we did. Yep. So, Good enough. Thanks, guys. I appreciate your input. You guys have a lot of experience with this stuff. Um, so, I appreciate it. Um, I will be announcing the winners on the message board in about five minutes. Um, <laughs> Thanks everybody for watching the show. Please go buy this. And, and it looks everybody in Ugly Radio, Arkansas, <laughs> Missouri, I my deepest apologies that you're stuck in those hell holes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Ouch. There go my sales in Missouri and Arkansas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, thanks, Mike. Yeah, thanks for watching, everybody. Guys, thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. Y'all behave yourselves. Talk to you guys soon.